Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our last special edition of a Hubble Hangout slash JWST, and I guess Kepler Hangout, too. Uh, and Kepler Hangout, too, yes. <laughs> uh, at the uh, South by Southwest Gaming Expo here in Austin, Texas. Things are still winding down. It's supposed to be closed now, but people are still milling around. People are still... Uh, there's still a lot of loud music and stuff like that. So, and, and as you can see off to the side here, Frank is still talking to some of the public. So, I wanted to go ahead and get started because it is, after all, nine o'clock Eastern time, daylight time now. Daylight. Oh yeah. yeah. I slept one less hour today. No yeah, I know. So, with me is Dr. Alberto Conte from Northrop Grumman, my old friend, and you guys know him. We do a lot of these together, and we're going to sit here and talk while um, while we get this thing, while people get kind of settled in, and other people here. We have Natalie Battaglia from. Kepler. Kepler. Ames. NASA Ames. NASA Ames. Ames. Right. She's yes. going to show us a new app. Is it an app for Kepler visualize, visualization? It's actually an app for uh, for Windows 8. Actually, I don't know if they have some other app, but it's, it's an app for uh, it's it's a it's a program really that runs on Windows, right? Right. So yeah. we're going to show you some of that that we've been showing to the public here because it's a really amazing way to kind of see the the number of planets, yeah. the number of planet candidates versus ex, you know uh, rocky planets and things like that. So <laughs> didn't realize you guys had started. Well, <laughs> we had started. I know. Also with me now is Frank Summers. Well, there were just people around, and yeah, so it got one. to be nine o'clock, and people were waiting, and I needed to get going. Go for it. Go so, for it. so anyway, um, so we're talking about. Uh, uh, so Natalie's going to be here. Frank Summers from the Space Telescope Science Institute. Sims is going to show us some of his uh, visualizations. We also have uh, Amber Strawn is still here, and. The panel today. You did a panel on called first yes, signs. First signs, uh, you know, finding life on other planets. Yes. So, did you find any? Not uh, life. I don't know. We, we we found something. We found that it was extremely engaging for everybody. I I had a lot so, of fun personally. So what was your actually before before we go into this? So what I want to so we had a panel basically describing a few things. So Natalie and you might want to bring her here afterwards. I don't know. So oh, I am. should tell yeah, you about uh, definitely. about Kepler, basically. Oh, we oh saw, I got yeah, a lot Natalie to ask. Nat about Natalie, don't you go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. She's well, walking we away. Had, uh, Amber Strom talked about JWST. We had Blake Bullock from oh, there Northrop Grumman. Oh, there she is. That's her. Uh, yeah, I'm <laughs> from Northrop Grumman uh, talking about uh, James Webb and engineering, and then I talk about kind of the future. So I don't know if we found life. We found that it was a very, very interesting uh, subject for lots of people. It was very engaging, I thought. We had lots of questions at the end. We had lots of uh, interest uh, in uh, social media about what NASA is doing right now, you know, in order to fulfill that, I, I call it almost like promise, right? To fulfill that dream that we want to find life right. on other planets. And uh, I don't know, you were on the receiving end, you were listening to us. I yeah, so, yeah. Well, so you, from my perspective, you geared it toward beginners, someone who didn't know anything at all, all about right. what was going on with space telescopes. And I'll, and I'll be honest with you, I've talked with a lot of people out here who have never heard of the Hubble Space Telescope. I asked them, do you know what Hubble is? They're like, no. So telling them what JWST is, is almost, you know, not worth it. You got to first start with what Hubble does. So it, I knew, I know why you had to do that. Yeah. And, and so you, you, you geared a lot of it towards, you know, what is a habitable zone? What are, what, are, what why are we looking for uh, planets with liquid water? Think, why does it matter? Things like that. But then toward the end, I thought you had, and I'm not saying this because you're standing next to me, because I can, I can, I can, I can take you any day, so I'm not afraid Absolutely. of you. Absolutely. <laughs> Neither am I. Let's go. <laughs> but I uh, know I thought part of the, the most, some of the most interesting stuff was the slides you showed about what, what, uh, looking beyond JWST. What, how scalable are space telescopes? Right. Uh, you know, building Hubble was one thing. It was constrained by the space shuttle. It had to fit in the space shuttle cargo bay. The James Webb Space Telescope was being launched on an Ariane rocket, one of the biggest we could find. This is pushing it. So if we want to build a bigger telescope than this, how are we going to do it? Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. one thing to build gigantic primaries, but and, and, does this thing scale? Yeah, Can you and, launch larger and, and space and telescopes? I guess my point in all that discussion was that, and you know this very well, astronomers are not going to stop at James Webb. No, right? of course not. They, they got to think about the next thing. They're going to plan the next thing. They need they need to think about uh, the, the next science that they can do once right. Webb uh, launches, because we know they're going to make amazing discoveries. And so uh, part of it is, you know. Uh, what are we going to do in terms of uh, being able to launch this structure? And I think I, I try to hammer the point that the fact that we're building web is a necessary step to understand how large deployable structures can be uh, really delivered, you know, to a million miles away, to fit, you know, to L, to let the second Lagrangian point to operate. And I think um, I think to some extent NASA is putting forward a roadmap for the next 30 years to figure out exactly where we want to go with this in terms of the science what are the science drivers right right, right. what are the science drivers why do you want 
and much larger telescope. And I think this is a very, very healthy discussion we're going to have, and it's a discussion that's gonna, that we're going to have over the next few years because, you know... Well, more like next few decades because this is a... And the next few this decades. Is, this is Absolutely. a hard problem to solve. It's so, a very hard problem to solve. I agree. I agree. I, another interesting point in the panel, and I don't know if it was Blake that said it or Amber, but it was about this, you know, this quote. I, I, one of the most often asked questions about JWST is what happens when a micrometeorite... You send it out to L2. Yeah. And what happens if micrometeorites pummel it to death, or what if you know what if something hits it? And I, I, the, the point is that the L2 point is actually a rel relatively unstable point gravitationally. Right. Right. Things don't want to stay there of their own accord, so it's actually a pretty clear area. It's actually a pretty safe zone to put a spacecraft because anything that would happen by would would not tend to want to stick around and hit, and hit right. JWST. Right. So. Um, I so think it's a relatively clean place. It's a clean a place. It's a possibility, but I don't think it's a real huge danger in, in, in large part because of the, uh, of, the, of the spot where it's going to be put. We'll right. talk about this some more, but I want to get right away into, now it's kind of clearing out a little bit. Yeah, Natalie, Natalie. Natalie, can I bring you over here for just a sec? So with me is Dr. Natalie Battaglia from uh, the Kepler mission. Hi, it's good to see you again. You. you have brought a really cool thing for us to look at that I am dying to show people. Would you step us through I'm gonna just put you over here by the yeah going over here by the sure, uh, sure, sure. monitor I'm gonna move the camera and is this too unwieldy for you to hold uh, or, I can try I might I might accidentally rip it off the computer but okay, I can try okay so yeah I, I'll, I'll hold it for you let me go move the camera a little bit so that you're centered and then um, we will move very high very high tech operation so, uh, while, you, while you're doing that can I just explain yeah, a little yeah, bit of what it's about so this is a brand new app, um, not an app, it's a visualization tool uh, to visualize the Kepler discoveries. Uh, it's brand new, this is kind of a sneak peek, hopefully soon really Hopefully soon, it will be released to the public so the public can play around with it. Um, but for now, anyway, it's kind of a work in progress, consider it to be a beta version, it still has some kinks, but... Uh, it's so you're saying this is... People will be able to get this and play I with it. I believe so. Eventually, that's the idea. Oh, yeah. great! Okay, great. Yeah. So anyway, I'll step you through it. All right. I'll try to I'll try to move the mic so that it can be so she can be heard. Oh gosh, can people hear? Is there anybody I'll on there it. online that can give us feedback? Okay. So I, I can tell by the indicators. So okay, I'm going to stand on this side so I can okay. have volume. Ah. Okay. Sky map. All right. So so I start with actually I'm just going to hold it. Um, so here we've got a sky map of the Kepler field of view. This is the patch of sky uh, where the Kepler has been targeting over the last four years to find exoplanets, potentially habitable Earth-sized exoplanets. It's about the size of my open hand um, projected or held out at arm's length on the sky between the constellations of uh, Deneb and Vega. Uh, I'm sorry, Deneb and Cygnus, the swan, and Lyra. Deneb is one of the brighter stars of Cygnus, and Vega is the brightest star of Lyra. And our field of view is nestled kind of underneath the wing of Cygnus the Swan right here. So every square that you see is one of the CCD detectors that measures brightnesses of these stars. Um, this is near the plane of the galaxy, so there are literally millions of stars in that one footprint on the sky, and Kepler has been monitoring about 150,000 of those stars. Um, so over here you see uh, let's see, data, the total counts of planets, so Kepler has now discovered over 3,800 planets orbiting other stars associated with about 2,961 stars, so lots of these planets are orbiting the same star, we have multiple systems, multi-planet systems, so Kepler's not just discovering planets, it's discovering planetary systems. Um, and that can be visualized really well looking at the orrery view. So here you see laid out all of the stars. Uh, well, the stars themselves are not shown, only the planets that are orbiting them. That's what's shown depicted with these circles. And you see them moving in their orbits at the correct orbital period, at the correct relative orbital period. Um, in this case, time has been significantly sped up. Um, the size of the circle is uh, scaled to the actual relative sizes of the planets. So we see circles that are 10 times larger than Jupiter, the gas giant in our solar system, all the way down to things that are half the size of an Earth, maybe the size of a Mercury. 
Um, so right now we're displaying all of the systems, all 3,864 planets around the 2,961 systems. Um, and so we can scroll and we can look at them. Uh, here you have a three-planet system. I can actually limit it to multi-planet systems by clicking this button. Uh, here we've got a four-planet system, four, three, two. Kepler has found five, even six, even now seven planet systems. Um, each planet contributing its own periodic sequence of, of little dimmings, diminutions of light. Um, so I can tell you that about 85% of what you're seeing here, um, if I go back to the whole entire sample, uh, I have about 85% confidence that any one of these is actually a true planetary system. Um, if you wanted to see those that have a higher than 99.7% confidence level, then I can click just the confirmed planets. Um, of the sample of about 4,000 planets, Kepler has confirmed approximately 1,000 of them now. Um, so that's what you're seeing here. Actually, 961 confirmed planets. Um, and you're seeing them in the Aura review. I can now limit this by the temperature, the surfer, the equilibrium temperature of the planet to try and isolate those that are in the Goldilocks zone. So I'm going to press this button here. Habitable zone. Zoom down. So these are the uh, the really valuable planets. These are the systems. Uh, the con let's see, did I do the? These are only the confirmed planets. So we have a larger than 99.7 percent uh, probability that these are bona fide planets, and they're in the habitable zone. All of this, all of these. So the the tool is telling me that there are 19 planets associated with 17 systems. I'm not certain that that doesn't, I'm not sure that that actually makes sense. So I'm, I don't know, I'm a little bit perplexed. That doesn't look like 17 to me, but anyway, these are our habitable zone planets. I can click on any one and get the actual name of that system. KOI 518, here I've got a five planet system. KOI 701. Uh, 701. KOI stands for Kepler Object of Interest. So as soon as we find a system that has indications of transits that are consistent with planets, it's given a number, a KOI number, Kepler Object of Interest. So for example, KOI 701 um, is now a confirmed planetary system. So it was also given a Kepler number. That is the Kepler 62 system. Uh, that has two confirmed planets in the habitable zone. Kepler 62 E and F are the green and blue outer planets. Uh, that, that blue one in the outermost orbit is just 40% larger than our own planet Earth. So we have a very high confidence that that is actually a rocky planet and Kepler 62 F is right smack in the middle of the habitable zone of that K-type star. So that's, that's probably my favorite planetary system that Kepler has discovered so far. Um, so I don't know. There's more I can tell you about the app. There are lots of different things you can plot. Um, but basically, that's it in a nutshell. There we go. Okay, so this this uh, app you say will be available uh, to mo this, this this will be a Windows kind of thing. Or? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, right now They're it's still running on it? a Windows system. It also right. runs on Mac. It's it's pretty independent. Yeah, this platform. is Windows 8 that it's running on. So, yeah, but it's not an app like an app for a phone. It's, it's a visualization. Thing. Sure, sure. And and so let's let's get to that. So so all of the Kepler data so far of all of the candidates versus the confirmed planets, all of that, even the stuff up to last month. Uh, but I believe you did a big announcement last month. 715 newly verified that's right. planets last week. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. I, did, I did a Spaceman News right. on that. So, um, okay, so uh, 
So we'll keep an eye out for when this is going to be available. But you, I have two questions that I'd like to, like to ask you. Number one is about last week. There's a, how come all of a sudden we can go from they're still gaming. How come we can go from all of a sudden to have all these candidates for you to just go straight to calling them uh, exoplanets now? What would tell us the technique that makes it all of it? Because if you look at the graph of all of the you know confirmed exoplanets, all of a sudden it spikes in February. It spiked a lot. Right. It doubled. Yeah. That's right. So what's different? Explain that because I'm still trying to get my head around that. So these are um, objects that we've discovered over the years. So we've known these were about candidates them. before. Yeah, they were candidates before. Um, but now we've got this logic of probability that's been applied to this particular sample. Um, I can give you an analogy. Let's say that you had a thousand people and you were going to tell them to go into a big football stadium and they were going to sit completely randomly in random seats in this stadium. Because the stadium is so big, there's not a very high probability that any two people would be sitting next to one another. Right? Well, how many people? I mean, just like a thousand. I mean, a, a small. Okay, compared small, to the number of seats. Yeah, exactly. Okay, compared got it. To the number of seats. So got there's it. not a high probability that you'd have two people. So a thousand people in a seventy thousand seat stadium, yes. chances are very small you're going to get any two people sitting together. Exactly. But you go to the stadium and you observe something different. You observe people sitting in groups, and so what do you conclude? You conclude that those people sitting in groups, they know each other, right? Mm -hmm. They came together. Or they've and got some kind of strange herd <laughs> mentality that you don't really want to know about. <laughs> so that's the kind of logic. It's a, it's a simplistic way of, of uh, making an analogy to the logic. Um, okay, that, that makes sense. So we these are our multiple planet systems. Okay. You know, there there are astrophysical things in nature that can confound us, right? We have, like I said, an 85 to 90 percent confidence level that all of these are planets. But if you really want that 99.7 percent confidence level, um, this is the sample that has that kind of a, a confidence because okay. of the multiplicity. It's just the odds of that happening are too small. So because le to everything be left to its own devices, randomly distributed planets would be would not be in a system. And yet Kepler doesn't that see way. that. Kepler is seeing a lot of clumps together of hundreds. Of, and well, so like thousands, so yeah. they can't be stars because they That's don't right. clump that way. Exactly. They they must be planets. And so That's you're right. saying with with 99% certainty that these are now planets. And That's so that right. that greatly expedites this candidate you know, to confirm. Yeah, uh, Jack Lissauer, one of the, the leaders of this study, he said okay. this is a uh, planet verification wholesale. Okay. Getting planets wholesale. Good, but well, uh, yeah, exactly. You go, see, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's right. You cut out the middleman, right? Cut out the middleman. Who needs ground-based telescopes? Yeah. I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. We need ground-based telescopes. We do. We want the masses <laughs> of all of these planets one day. We want to know what their atmospheres are. But for now. What's important, you know, using ground-based telescopes is very expensive, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's much oh, well, better so space if I can tell you, you know, what are you going to use your five nights on the Keck telescope for? If I can say I've got a planet here that has a 99.7% probability of being a true planet, and over here I've got one that has an 85% probability, right. which you, one are you going to Yeah, choose? exactly. You're going with the yeah? lower probability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, that makes sense. Well, that's better than the analogy they used in the press release, which was about lions yes. and lionesses. That was I, got, I scratched choice. my head. So lions are stars and lionesses are planets. Oh, don't go there. Don't go there. La, 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 Hey, I didn't write it. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> and that's why I'm trying to go, okay, well, I'll use that analogy then. But so that this is a better one. I like yours much better. So thank you. One more thing. Today, at the panel, yes. you said something that blew my mind, and I want to clear. I want to. I want to talk about this a little bit. But well, no, people are really interested in the status of the Kepler telescope. Okay. I mean, we're all sad that that, that the momentum wheels have have died on those, and that it's not able to continue. It's not accurately pointing. It's not able to accurately point enough to in continue the, to, to to continue to try to find these planets in, in a, that particular field of view. In that particular field of view. Yeah. Good. Well, That's we'll get to that too. In a, okay, good. <laughs> and then you said, well, wait a minute. The, the engineers have come up with a way yeah. to use sol to use solar radiation pressure mm -hmm. to basically act such that it has a momentum wheel that it wouldn't have had yeah. before. Yeah. Now, does that mean it'll be pointing in a different area of the sky? Exactly. That's right. You, so, what is that area? So uh, the ecliptic. So it's along the orbital plane. That's the plane so where the Earth follows you know, around the sun. Yeah, you have yeah. these three axes of rotation that have to be stabilized, right? Right. But we've only got two gyroscopes. So we're going to take that third axis. And, and luckily, 
the spacecraft has a symmetry axis, okay? Meaning that it spins around a... a no, meaning that geometrically it's a symmetric shape. Oh, okay. okay so That's the longitudinal we, axis, right? So, so yeah. if we take that side of the telescope and we face it towards the sun, it's like taking a canoe and pointing it perfectly upstream. Okay, right? I get that. It's like a wind vane. Yeah, also, because the canoe yeah. is perfectly symmetric, the oncoming water is going to push equally on all sides of the canoe. Okay. And that's what we're going to do with the telescope. We're going to take that, that symmetric side and face it towards the sun. The solar pressure pushes on it, but it does so in a balanced way that controls that third axis. And that's accurate enough to be able to look at in the new patch of sky. And so it's anywhere along the ecliptic. Anywhere along the So ecliptic. it'll be sweeping a path across as it does its orbit around the sun. That's exactly right. So who knows? I mean, yeah. way more than a... I mean, I mean, I know why you stared at, at Cygnus. I mean, you wanted to get deep image. You wanted to get a lot of time. We to get statistics. That's right. You and and you wanted to get time data, right? A lot of lot oh, of, absolutely. A lot of light Four curves. Four years. We a lot wanted to be sensitive curves. to Earth analogs. Right. And we wanted to get statistics of lots of planets. So, uh, what do you? I know you said they're going to decide on this in April uh, on, on April Fool's Day. They're going to NASA. Oh, will NASA decide or? That's when our presentation is to the senior review panel. The oh, astrophysics okay. senior review. Oh, okay. Our presentation is on April first. Okay. And uh, see how excited they are. Yeah, I told you, <laughs> Kepler. <laughs> yeah, Kepler. <laughs> so uh, then we'll hear like the end of, by the end of May whether or not uh, NASA can fund it. Okay. So. All right. So I'm sorry. The end of May, you said? Around the end of May, beginning okay. of June, oh, somewhere okay. around there. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I know that they're they've got proposals out and, and they got people thinking about what else to use Kepler for. Oh my gosh. You, you know, in its current state. Yeah. And, and that's great that they're that they're thinking along not wasting Kepler and to continue to use it. Yeah, but it's I don't think really without a doubt any there's anybody out there that would love to see it continue to try to find exoplanets in whatever Oh, capacity. all kinds of science. Yeah. Um, people are proposing to do amazing things with the telescope. Yeah. All yeah. kinds of stellar astrophysics, galaxies, supernovae, micro lensing, all kinds so of So essentially stuff. you've got one proposal among others of all these others and then NASA That's will right. sit through all those and decide. Uh, well, no, I mean, if Kepler, do you have priority? if NASA, no, 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 this is a community telescope. It's going to be open to the community. Okay. We are not choosing any of the targets. Oh, okay. The community is going to choose all of the targets. Um, but of course, Exoplanets is one of the most hot topics, right? So lots of people I are see. proposing. Oh, to I do see what you're saying. All yeah, right, so this is one of many things it could still do, and now that you can point it with that longitudinal exactly. axis away from the sun. That's okay. right. Yep. All right. Well, that blew me away, and I was so happy to hear that. So thank oh, you very good. much, Natalie. I appreciate it. Thank you for taking time out to, to talk to us and show us this stuff. Thank you for having me. I hope me. I can it's get Frank. Did he leave? Okay. Frank all right. Is right here. All right. So thank you're you. That on, was Natalie Natalia from the Kepler Space Mission. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Where do you want me? Uh, why don't you stand over here because uh, you're going to be over there soon. I'm going to have to move the camera. So one of the things that we've been trying to do out here at South by uh, at the Gaming Expo is to get the word out, not just about JWST but uh, and, and with Kepler, but also about some new things from Hubble. And most notably, <laughs> uh, Hubble still after almost 25 years, which, by the way, well, actually, it's 24th anniversary is next month. 24th right? anniversary next month. 24 Although, years. i got to tell you. Secret for just you guys who are watching us, we're actually going to release the 24th anniversary image this month. Okay, there's this big conference in Rome, and we're going to release the 24th anniversary image a month early. Although we'll do some cool stuff for the 24th anniversary. All right, but yes, how old's 24th anniversary? And in what, 14 months? Yeah, 13, yep. 14, 14. 13, 13 months, we'll have Hubble's 25th anniversary, which will be a really cool event. You can you imagine all the cool stuff we've got planned for that. Not bad for a telescope designed to work for five years. I mean, that's pretty good. I think it was 10 years. But <laughs> oh, I, was it whatever. 10? Okay. I, I think Hubble's original goal was 10 years. Okay, but... I wasn't around back then. I, was, we're I, be pushing, I back think then. I think they're going to be pushing for thirty on this one by the time it's all over. There I is there is going to make thirty. There is some uh, 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 some designed overlap between Hubble and JWST going forward, so that'll be uh, that'll be an exciting time. Then both telescopes up at the same time. So you bet. Let's, let's hope that all works out the way it is. So Frank has over the course of the last not just year, but over the, more than that, right? A couple of years, you've been working on a lot of different visualizations of all kinds of different uh, things. Yeah, right? I've been working on visualizations. Um, since I did my PhD thesis back in 1993, um, and my first really big visualization was uh, working on the IMAX film Cosmic Voyage in 1996. So I've been developing my skills, going moving from an astronomer who does data visualization, right? I mean, things to do for my PhD thesis. I was just trying to do data visualization to understand what's going on in these computer simulations. 
And then when I started doing the IMAX, we worked on the IMAX film, I learned about how to take, take that and turn it into what we call cinematic scientific visualizations, where it speaks not only to the geek astronomers, but also starts to speak to the general public, uh, taking real data from Hubble, real data from these simulations, and putting it, expressing it in ways that the public really can embrace as well. So why don't you show us some of the things you've been showing the public here, and I'm going to go move the camera. Uh, you move the camera. Yeah. Oh, and when you're talking, if you could hold this when you get set up, I'd appreciate it, like Natalie did, so we can hear you. All right. So, holding the big microphone. Cool. All right, so I'm going to show you a couple of the visualizations that we were showing off. Now, these are visualizations that we have done for Hubble press releases. And the first one, um, as it's, you can see the title here, is Crash of the Titans, uh, Milky Way and Andromeda Collision. Now, we have known for, oh, what is it, decades, about 100 years we have known that Andromeda is headed towards the Milky Way. But it wasn't until just uh, two years ago or a year and a half ago that Hubble was able to measure the sideways motion of Andromeda. And so we know that it's coming towards us, but if it's moving sideways a lot, then it might circle around the Milky Way. All right, but Hubble was able to make an ultra-fine and ultra-precise measurement, I mean, measurements down to seven one-thousandths of a pixel in terms of the motions of stars to measure the sideways motion of Andromeda. And so based upon those, uh, those observations, we're able to tell the true 3D space motion of Andromeda relative to the Milky Way, and it turns out that the trajectory is consistent with a head-on collision. Now, that's something really cool, right? So we figured, all right, we have to show that in, in our press release. And so we created this visualization um, with, uh, with some folks up at Columbia University and Harvard University and Roland van der Marle, the Space Telescope Science Institute. So you'll see that the uh, visualization starts with our Milky Way galaxy. And for the first billion years, not much is happening. So we focus on the Milky Way and then pull back and show you the Andromeda galaxy, the other large galaxy in our local group, and the Triangulum galaxy, which is sort of the one medium-sized galaxy in our local group. These are the three big galaxies. And then the camera swings around, so you can see how thin the, the Andromeda galaxy is. And about 3.9 billion years from now, the Andromeda and Milky Way galaxies are smashing through one another, right? They go smashing through one another. The Triangulum Galaxy is just is orbiting around them, but they become gravitationally bound and they come smashing back together, mixed together, and about five and a half billion years from now, the Milky Way and Andromeda will be one galaxy. They will have merged together to become a single galaxy. Now, in most of the versions of this simulation, in the of the, they, the most of the versions that they tested when they varied the parameters, the Triangulum galaxy stays outside of it, but in 10% of them, the Triangulum galaxy actually merges with Andromeda and the Milky Way. So, in some of the cases, actually all three of the big galaxies in the local group become one galaxy about five or six billion years from now. And that's some of the, that, that's that's one of the visualizations we've been showing here. We actually have an entire list of about 30 different visualizations that we've been showing off while we're here. Do we want to chat on, on, on something, or do you want me to try and... Sh oh. All right, hold on. Okay. Uh, let me just go ahead and play the next one that's in the, in the list. I don't know. I... <laughs> All right, I'll pause that there. All right, um, we've got a playlist up here. I actually don't have a playlist memorized, so I don't know what's going on. But I, you can see we've got these title screens for us. Um, so this one is a really nice one that shows how multi-wavelength astronomy uh, really works together. So this is the active galaxy Hercules A. And it's called Hercules A because it is the brightest radio source in the constellation of Hercules. Uh, Cassiopeia A, Cygnus A, Sagittarius A are similar things that are the brightest radio sources in their constellations. So active galaxy Hercules A, when you see it in a Hubble image, isn't actually as impressive as you might think. All right, It is a giant elliptical galaxy. All right, and this galaxy is about 10 times the mass of uh, our Milky Way galaxy. All right, and it's, but it's, so it's a giant elliptical galaxy, but it looks a lot like other giant elliptical galaxies. And so 
thinking of it as the most most powerful radio source doesn't really show up in this image. So we're going to play the visualization for a little bit. As we pull back from the galaxy to show the group of galaxies around it. Now, this galaxy, these giant elliptical galaxies, generally are in these large, large clusters of galaxies that have hundreds to thousands of galaxies. And this one seems to be in a relatively small cluster of galaxies containing just dozens of galaxies. And it's kind of strange. But what really makes this uh, interesting is that there is a supermassive black hole at the center of this giant elliptical galaxy. And that supermassive black hole has an intense emission that streams across not just interstellar space, but actually across the entire galaxy and across intergalactic space. You can't see that emission in Hubble's observations, but you can see it in the radio observations. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this model of the Hubble observations and we're going to superimpose on it in three dimensions the radio observations from the very large array. So if I continue the observations, the, the visualization, you can see these pink radio lobes. And while the galaxy extends hundreds of thousands of light years across, these radio lobes actually extend about a million light years across, not just interstellar space, but actually intergalactic space. And this is one of the visualizations we did that we actually did in stereo 3D. So as we rotate these lobes, you can actually see this lo lobe over here on the right coming towards you. So those are two of the visualizations that we've been showing here. Uh, we've got um, about 30 more. And what we're really doing is we're, sh we're, uh, we're showing off that uh, we've got a new, uh, a new web page on Hubble site where we are featuring these videos. And of course, we're featuring them on our YouTube channel, Hubble site channel as well. So we have put up, there we go. <laughs> we have put up a brand new web page at hubblesite.org slash videos that we've got, uh, what have we got, about 20 of them there by now? I don't um, know how many. You yeah, put we, up a lot. I know that. We've got about 18 of them there, uh, five of which are stereo 3D. So if you own a stereo 3D TV at home, you can download them and play them on the TV and put your glasses on and go, oh, wow, I'm cruising through the 3D universe on your living room couch, which is kind of cool. Um, and we'll be adding new ones about once every other week for the foreseeable future because we have a whole backlog that we're going through. We're processing them. We're putting them out there at, at full HD, 1920 by 1080. We've got them in QuickTime. We've got them in, in WebM, the HTML5 codec, and even in Windows Media. So we try and hit you and give you all the cool things in all the different varieties of the ways that you guys want them. Yeah, and I, and I know a lot of you are watching them because uh, the, we, I was showing you the views today. The, yeah. the YouTube channel has spiked in views to almost uh, about three times normal. So you guys are watching them, and these are downloadable. For me, the way I look at it, Frank, is this is all new new material for me <laughs> to start making videos with. So I thank you for all this effort. No, it is impressive. Hubble continues to uh, amaze and to give us great, great material even after all these years. So... Thank you for your efforts, Frank. I really appreciate it. Um, I just want to echo your, your, your comment there. Is that, I mean, Hubble may be 24 years old, but uh, we had a service commission in 2009 that rejuvenated it, and, you know, it's still at one of its, it's still at the peak of its powers, okay? It's, st it's not, um, it is not old and creaky and, and tattered and worn. It is still a viable Hubble uh, instrument, and astronomers still really, really, really want to get time on it. It's totally oversubscribed. So Hubble is is it's got many good years left in it. That's right. So with me all with us, come around uh, come around this side and stand over next to Frank. So Hi next up. next we have uh, Christine Tom Christina Thompson from Northrop Grumman. She's the she's the you're way more. I don't want to just call you like the press person because it's like you you do so much more. You're like in charge of everything. Last year and this year you're like. You know, still getting us all lined up and ready and saying the right things and doing the right things. Thank you. And also, Dr. Bonnie Mike Mike you from yesterday. You remember her? She's a OPPO outreach scientist. So, um, these outreach efforts from Northrop Grumman's perspective, is this something you guys do a lot of, or, or is JWST kind of special in that way? No, we definitely do a lot of outreach at Northrop Grumman, but the James Webb Space Telescope is the perfect program for us. Um, 
we say that it's leading the next generation in the space. And it's the perfect program to be able to um, go out to the public and talk with people, inspire young kids to get interested in science yeah. and technology. So it's really kind of a treat for us to come to events like this because people are so curious about the Webb Telescope and they just want to know more. So it's kind of a great way to um, connect with people and you know bring science out to the public. What about the people that work at, at Grumman? And I, I mean, do you do you guys do you feel a sense that the employees have a sense of pride in what they're doing? Or I mean, I know that if I worked there, I'd be like, hey, you know, I'm working on mirror camera, I'm working on the back plane, or I'm working on the the mirror segments or whatever. I'd be like going yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, I walk around the halls and people are excited to be building something for NASA. You know, it's kind of a very cool thing to be able to say that we're helping NASA to build the next telescope to be the successor to the Hubble. I mean, it's not every day that you get to go to work and work on something that'll actually revolutionize the way we understand our universe. I know. So. Uh, I say the same thing about where I work. It's like the Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah, I'll be glad to. I'll be glad to spread the word on that. It's, a, it's an easy job. So, well, uh, what was your impression here of this of, of this of this gaming expo? I mean, I know that. Last year we had a bigger footprint here. We had the main model and thing. We had a much scaled down version this time. But I don't know. I felt like we saw, we saw quite a few people, didn't you? I did. I thought that it was really a great experience because people were, you know, innately interested in science. Uh, people who are interested in gaming tend to be, you know, curious about what else is out there. At least They're they were receptive. That, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, the idea of fantasy or thinking about things other than the here and now. So I thought it was a great way to just kind of connect in with this culture kind of a different venue than we would normally go to at Northrop Grumman, but it's definitely a way for us to reach a new and younger audience, I think. That's a good point, yeah. yeah. So we were talking earlier today, uh, I think Northrop Grumman and, uh, and the Institute, I think with these hangouts, we're going to look and try to make an effort over the coming year to do right. a little bit more integration with getting some more of the maybe the, the uh, Northrop engineers involved and getting some, we talked to the chief engineer yesterday, he was an outstanding person to have around. I mean, what a source of information. So I think we're, right. we can look forward to some of that kind of collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks Great. All right, well, thank you for seeing yeah, yeah. right. Bonnie, I know we, we got to get tear. We got to start tearing down, but I had to talk to you. Yeah, I, I just. We can't tear down until the crates are here, so it doesn't even matter. Oh, that's right. We got to wait. <laughs> that's a good point. Okay. Bonnie has been tireless in, in this weekend and getting things going. Uh, I don't know. What are, you, what are your impressions? <laughs> it's not tireless. I'm pretty tired. Well, <laughs> well okay. You're now start, we all, I think we're all getting a little bit a little bit long in the tooth here with yeah. this. Yeah. yeah. So what, what, what was your impression? Do you feel like we, we accomplished our mission here with getting the word out to another I people? think so. I think a lot of people came to the booth knowing what Hubble was. Um, Hubble's very much a household name at this point. People know what Hubble is. Uh, that was a good entry point for a lot of people. We were able to say, hey, do you know about Hubble? Well, here's the next big thing. Right. And that really sparked their interest. Seeing the fantastic mirrors kind of drove it home that this is a big deal. It's huge and fantastic and really important. Uh, telling kids that it was kind of like Transformers um, when she launched it into space and the whole thing has to deploy. Yeah. Yeah. That really kind of hooked them, I think, in a lot of ways. And uh, I think people left here with a greater understanding of what the James Webb Space Telescope will be, or and or uh, a better understanding of the science that Hubble has currently accomplished and how that will translate into the Webb era. Yeah, so I wanted to ask your opinion on something. Today at the panel, there was a question at the end of it. This was the panel that Alberto and this oh, guys yeah. did. There was a, one of the people came up and, and go, I noticed like there's a gender skew up here, and uh, Alberto was the only guy, yeah. right? We had, we had, it was Blake and, and Amber and, um, and Natalie up there with them. Yeah. Now he knows what it feels like. Yeah. <laughs> and I tweeted that, you know, it was something I've noticed too. More, I've seen a lot more women in astronomy over the past, say, I don't even, maybe 10 years than I had in the previous, you know, mm -hmm. 10, 10, maybe 20 years. Um, and I wanted to get your impression of that. Is that something, do you feel like that's sort of equalizing or is there still a long way to go as far as the gender issues in, in astronomy and science? Uh, there's there's still a ways to go, but okay. you're right. Things are getting better. Things are improving. The climate is improving overall, which makes it easier to enter the field, makes it uh, more friendly to stay around. And so there's you know more women in my generation of scientists, and I think the, the next generations to follow, there will be increasingly more. Um, it's interesting though because there's a kind of a sociological phenomenon that happens when women and men, uh, when, when the percentage of women gets above a certain critical point, um, and it's usually somewhere in like the 25 to 30 percent range. 
people are like, oh, it's equal. Uh, so, so I think we're we're almost there in astronomy. It's Some things are more equal, equal than others. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not equal yet, but it's it's to the point where uh, people don't notice that that oh, there's there's no women. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I have a 20, feeling, you know, I have a feeling that there's there's fewer uh, you know undergraduate women in astronomy now. Okay. That that I, there there's there's fewer that feel the way that I felt, where you're the only woman in the class. Um. You know, especially in a, in a large lecture, there's definitely other women there. And even in an upper division in a graduate level class, there's, you know, three, four other women to do homework with in a, in a class of, say, ten. Good. So that's it's a good that's thing. Awesome. It's, it's an awesome really thing. Good. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder what that is. Can you attribute that to anything? Or is uh, it just so many factors you just can't really pin it down? Uh, well, I think in, in a certain uh, certain places, certain uh, institutions, universities have adopted certain policies that make it uh, a friendlier okay. climate. Okay. And it's that friendlier climate that really makes a difference. So there are some places where there's no women on faculty, that's an unfriendly environment. There's other places that have really made a concerted effort. And we need and to, so to applaud is starting, those is places. Starting to get, starting to get there, yeah. starting to get somewhere. Our boxes are starting to show up. Yay! So uh, I think well, I think <laughs> nice. I'm gonna have to start cutting this 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 short. Did Alberto leave? Yes. Oh okay. So. Darn it, I was gonna say goodbye. <laughs> the sooner okay. the boxes get here, the sooner I I know, when there's work to be done, there's like Alberto is like gone. There's like he's out of here. No. All the women scared him off. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right, folks. Seven well, forbid more than three women in a room. Ah. <laughs> Okay, guys, I hope this was helpful to you. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, we'd like to get a chance to uh, do more of these with you. We're going to be uh, collaborating a little bit more with the Northrop Grumman over the coming year, like we talked about. Alberto ha and I have some good ideas for some uh, engineering hangouts coming forward, and I think you find, you'll find those interesting. So thank you guys for tuning in and uh, supporting us through all this, and we will pick up our Hubble hangouts probably a little bit later on next month. So thank you guys for watching, and as always, keep looking up.